I would like all the delegates to note that this is the current experiment that is going on on a very large scale. I am so happy that Professor Ashok Jujunwala's initiative has resulted in well-known faculty members going directly to the students. As you know, we have been doing teachers training for a long time, and we train 10,000 teachers exactly using the same mode. But he has ventured to go out to a large number of teachers, a large number of students directly, using a large number of well-known teachers. Now, that's an extraordinary initiative, and that will give us much more valuable feedback on, as Professor Russell said, what may not work and what needs to be tweaked. As I mentioned yesterday, IIT Bombay MOOCs courses would be offered, but we would be necessarily limiting our first pilot to at most 100,000 students going directly to students. So I will request the university, state technical university vice chancellors and deans uh, to determine which of their colleges would be perhaps ready to take these courses and uh, we'll get back to them uh, later on more details. Uh, with this, may I now request uh, Professor Kincha to kindly lead the panel discussion on affiliating universities are ideally suited to harness technology to improve quality. Actually, they are ideally suited to harness everything because they are the ones who are directly in charge of the education of so many colleges. So it's an oxymoron to some, some extent, but there are issues that need to be discussed. And I would request Professor Kincha, Dr. Anandan, <coughs> Pavan Agarwal, uh, Praveen Prakash. May I request uh, the Vice Chancellors of STUs present here, any two of them to volunteer to join the panel discussion, please? Anyone? If, if vice chancellors are not there, any senior representative from the, from the university? Please. Thank you. So without further ado, I'll request Professor Kincha to take charge. All yours, sir. Good morning to all of you. Tough job. We have a very distinguished seven panelists over here. And total time given is about 40 minutes. That's the time that is given to us. So it is a very tough job and I think tough job for all the panelists also. And I will start taking maybe two minutes and I'll request each one of my panelists to probably speak for about two and a half to three minutes each. So because I say three minutes will make it five minutes and then probably we'll throw it open to the audience for interactions uh, for about ten minutes. Is, that is my schedule. I'll, I'll, I'll probably just take my two minutes as the chairman's prerogative or the coordinator's prerogative. We've been talking about this technology in education for uh, yesterday and this morning for about an hour. <coughs> but if you see education and universities in the same tone as the media houses or the newspapers that have all changed, thoughts come that the universities also will change in the same way. But it is not true, because <coughs> if you see the trend of um, the admissions that is going on into top universities, the competition is getting tougher. More institutions are starting up every day. The enrollments throughout the world is increasing in the universities. And uh, there is premium paid for graduates who come out for such universities. So the universities probably will not find that type of uh, change as happened to the media houses and to the newspaper or to the music industry. But still, transformation of university is inevitable. That is for sure. For all of us, we agree that transformation is inevitable. And we talk about this transformation of change by talking about different things. We talk, say that we need more technology in education. We say that we need online education. We need uh, these hybrid uh, types of uh, educations. We need to replace <coughs> traditional departments with uh, uh, maybe problem-solving type of departments. We talk of different solutions for this. But to my mind, I think probably the change is required in structures and operating models of universities. 
I think that that is very critical, the structures and operating models of the universities and what are these new structures and what are these new operating models of the universities is the thing that probably we should be debating upon. Today, if you talk about uh, the education system, the online education system, it is nothing but broadcast and browse, publish and browse. This is all the online education is all about today. Probably we have to go much beyond this publish and browse model of the online education system or the online system. We have to also probably think about moving from the mass production to mass customization of education, the mass customization of education. Students at present day want to learn, but they want to learn only from what they want to learn from. And also they want to learn in the way they want to learn. So the syndrome of the doctor knows best or the professor knows best of what to teach probably will need to be changed. And that syndrome that I know the best and therefore I teach you what I want to teach you. I think that probably the student has to come to the central attention focus and in this technology enhanced learning program, the students' centric te uh, education probably will take the center stage. <coughs> university 2.0, if I am talking about University 2.0 of the future, probably we will need, as I said, new operating models, new financial models. For example, maybe new transfer pricing models as we talk in the industry is what will be required. And what are these new transfer pricing models? We don't know still. I don't know what are these transfer pricing models. We yesterday talked about um, assessment, rights, and so many things, copyrights and all those things. But I think we need to work on a new transfer pricing models, and which will be very critical in running the new types of uh, University 2000s, University 2.0. Any new change will bring in dislocation, will bring in disruptions, will bring in confusions and will bring in uncertainty. This is the typical American military term, the VUCA world, as, was, as is coined and is very often today. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. And I think the education world also is this VUCA world with this change coming into this. And probably we need to get a mindset where we are able to take in, take in our mindset and use our first-rate intelligence, which has never failed us in the past, to hold maybe opposing viewpoints in our mind and still continue to get the abilities to function with these opposing thought points thought, uh, and viewpoints in our mind. And that will probably talk about uh, the, the, what we may call as the balance that we need to get into their education systems. Balance of uh, quantity versus quality, the balance of repair versus prepare, the balance of price versus cost, the balance of funding versus delivery, and the, fund, and the balance of excellence versus inclusion. I think all these are difficult problems for our, news, for our systems, and probably we need to work on the dichotomies of these situations into the same mind and then work towards the solution using the technology base. I'll stop here and then probably request my colleagues on the table over here. I think starting from the left side over here, uh, we have Professor Shankar from JNTU Anandpur for his three minutes so far. For his three minutes, please. Good morning, everybody. It's my privilege to be associated with this uh, panel for discussion. I am from uh, JNTU Anandpur one of the budding universities, uh, which is uh, now sixth year. But uh, we had the experience of uh, conducting through university because 1972, JNTU has been uh, there in Hyderabad. Now, uh, regarding the quality education programs, the university has taken the lead as a nodal center and a direct, as a director of academic and planning, we have been conducting the uh, teacher's training programs for uh, accreditation process. And... Uh, <coughs> Being a rural area, uh, we have got uh, several other activities. We have got equip funding also. And uh, Anantapur teacher-student ratio has been uh, very predominant. The national average is uh, teacher-student level of satisfaction is uh, 
more than the national average as per the TechWhip norms, uh, as per the statistics that is being available. And uh, yesterday, I made a specific point that for every profession, there is a training program before they take up the actual work. But unfortunately, in the present scenario, the teacher training programs are not being there before they take up teaching as a profession. Many people are not taking teaching as a profession. So far, it has been a stopgap arrangement. As rightly pointed out by other speakers, the cream of the people are not joining in teaching profession as per the statistics so far. And uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor K. Alkishore, who is uh, also a member of the ESDM, Electronic System Design and Manufacturing uh, of the national uh, body, uh, has introduced the online courses through Synopsis Electronics Education and Research in uh, VLSA system design and embedded systems, and also through Carnegie Mellon University, through consortium of Institute of Higher Learning, through AP State Government, we have started MSIT programs also, simultaneously with three JNTUs of Andhra Pradesh, and also IIIT Hyderabad. And uh, we have also introduced for quality improvement enhancement the anti-plagiarism software, and also we have uh, taken emoji with South Ganga, and uh, already 72 theses have been uploaded. And uh, <coughs> further, I, as a senior member of IEEE and director of academic planning, among the affiliated colleges, I am insisting that professional society membership must be taken either at the student level or individual level or in the institutional level. Particularly, the professional worldwide organization like IEEE as a service for humanity and ASME, ASCA, All India Management Association, etc. This will enhance and enrich the knowledge and uh, the students uh, uh, for their benefit, for mutual exchange of ideas and developing their communication skills, etc. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request Professor Goswami, Vice Chancellor of Assam University now. So I'm Dr. P.K. Goswami. Actually, my background is I'm an electrical engineer. I have graduated from Assam. And then I, I came to IIT Madras for my master course. Then I went to London for PhD. Then I did my postdoctoral from Japan. I'm telling this background because I have started my career as a lecturer of engineering college. Then I become vice chancellor. Then before that, I was director of technical education. And then I, I was principal of engineering college also. So I know a little bit what is going on in the engineering side. So if you ask me what change is necessary for the undergraduate program, Actually, undergraduate program throughout India it should be common. At least in the fifth up to sixth semester onward, courses should be common. Because what I teach in Assam, what I teach in Kerala, what I teach in Tamil Nadu should not be different. Because students will be aiming for appearing the gate examination. If our courses are designed such a way that students are everywhere is very good. Assam student, Bengal student, or Orissa student, or Kerala student are same. But exposure of the courses are different. So that's why they find they have to go for a special coaching for gate examination. Gate is mandatory now a day for public sector job and getting admission to master courses. So I my request to all these panelists, all, all these people is there, somehow we should have a common course at least from the seventh semester onward throughout all of our India. Then I think our students will be exposed to uh, the common platform. The students are good. Then third point is there that when I was the director of technical education, I was trying that uh, we have selected 20 teachers from all the colleges of Assam, and I'm asking them to take the classes in different courses. So he's a good in mathematics. Then as the, as we do not have any credit system that uh, to mark the teacher, so I was voluntarily asking the student, who is your best teacher? So I give that teacher a, a little bit extra money, but that teacher is selected only for one session only. Otherwise, there will be some groupies will be there. So I was selecting for one session, then I asked him to take the class in another class where the shortage of faculty. Mainly in our time, computer science and electronics was very shortage of faculty. So we have at least a sick, good teacher. So I pick up them all, and I allow them to take the classes. And I take the feedback from the students. So that way also, in from IIT Guwahati, we have some collaboration from the state engineering colleges. IIT Guwahati also, we send some students for the training. Even for teacher also goes there. And if you find that all our good teachers are joining IIT Guwahati, now we have a shortage of faculty. NIT Silsar and IIT Guwahati and even in at Espoo University, most of my colleague or my student has joined in their their process because there are sort of the faculty that they get the job. So another point I'm just thinking as a not as a this teacher, whether teacher all the teacher age should be up to sixty five or not. 
because sometimes some teachers do not study at all. Some efficiency should be calibrated, and depending on that, you can even go for the age of 70 for some good teacher, not even for 65. So that way, some that, that you can just filter them out because you want a teacher in a state engineering college, you cannot remove them if they do not take any class also for 35 years. So that is, I do not know whether it is good or bad. So thank you very much. This is my observation. Can I request Professor Mohan now, please? Very good morning to all of you. I'm Professor Mohan, uh, currently the director, uh, National Institute of Technical Teachers Training and Research. I have been in IIT Madras for 25 years and uh, teaching in civil engineering environmental. Uh, one thing that uh, I would like to tell, the teacher training, uh, it is a very important thing. Somehow we have been neglecting for engineering. Uh, even for LKG teacher, if I become an LKG teacher, I have to undergo the Montessori training. Otherwise, I cannot become a teacher. But unfortunately, here we are going directly as a, yesterday if I am graduated, today I become a teacher. Which I think, it is not the teacher is getting affected, it is more the students are getting affected. Almost I have to train around 10 batches of students before I become a good teacher. So that means the 10 students become the testing animals for us. So which is not a good thing for uh, teaching. So this is fun. One thing that we have to make compulsory, uh, if not joining, but at least within a two-year period before you make him as a permanent teacher, I think he has to undergo a training on pedagogical aspect. That's one. The second one, the university, uh, especially the students would have uh, some flexible hours, but unfortunately we are loading them too much in my opinion. Uh, we have six courses and three practical and he doesn't have time to think over. So un unless we make slightly, because always we always say that the student will be free, he will do something else. So if we want ICT and more thinking power, I think we have to reduce to maximum um, four courses and two labs. So then only he will be able to think over or munch over the thing. Uh, this is, I think, IIT Kanpur is a very successful model where they have, in fact, IIT Tekanpur, only four courses will be there in the masters uh, and only maximum two practical. But uh, because somehow we are very conservative as teachers, we wanted to give more courses and we have wanted to complete the syllabus or cover the syllabus rather than uncovering the syllabus as such. So I think the university has to make little more flexibility for the student to take the course. And why I'm saying is, suppose I am a civil engineer, 50% courses would be compulsory in civil engineering. Remaining 50, he can take anywhere. So, so that, you know, these ICT courses, which has been transmitted by IIT or other kind of a thing. Suppose I am interested in physics, I will go and sit in the physics class and then uh, listen to them. So otherwise, you know, if I have six or seven courses, and I may not have time to go and sit in uh, the common classes or my interesting classes. I think this is one thing that we may have to uh, change our mindset, especially the teachers have to change the mindset. I think this is one thing that it is missing in our uh, kind of a thing because we always look at the students uh, uh, to be loaded too much. But I think this is, I am little different opinion. So I'll stop here, sir. So thank you very much. So I think this is maybe second round. Mr. Praveen Prakash, please, for this opinion from the government side of Yes. Uh, in brief, I will uh, say that the future of technology-enabled learning in India is in the hands of state technical university. Uh, why I say so, because engineering education is one field where a lot of work has been done. You have content ready, NPTEL, virtual lab. You have a, a mechanism also through ten, uh, uh, training to 10,000 teachers. You have also mechanism, protocols also ready. Now the country or everybody is asking for outcome, asking for results. And Dr. Ura is here from Influvinet. He was making a presentation and he was ta talking about all the projects he's doing. And for other side, people were sitting in the ministry they're asking only one question. You don't, this all is fine. Tell us how many students are there in the university, how many are using. These questions are going to come back again and again and again and again. 
And if we don't succeed in engineering education, I see I'm very uncomfortable because I have committed myself for <laughs> next five years for technology-enabled learning. I mean, five years of my life. I have committed, and I'm, that's why I was very keen to meet all of you, those who are from State Technical University. It's not only about your students. It's not only about the 36 or 40 lakh students who are in engineering. It's about 2.6 crore students who are in this country in, in higher education. And that's the responsibility you have. You heard uh, Professor Ashok Junjanwala. And whenever we think about techn technology education and whatever we have made, we said we have made content, but syllabus is not common, examination is not common. But state technical university, that's an asset. You have common, uh, you have common syllabus, you have common examination system. All that we said there is no freedom in our uh, system can be converted through technology to our advantage. Uh, that's why we the first uh, for the usage side, the first MOUs which we have entered are with State Technical University. Yesterday I was discussing with Pawan Sir. Pawan said, let's give them three, four months time and then let's them prepare the detailed project report for State Technical University. I said no. Uh, I gave them seven days time, said that let, we, we want to enter into MOU. All of them came, which means there is a burning desire in State Technical Universities also. I, I, on the behalf of all State Technical Universities, I promise him that on the 3rd uh, March, when we are having standing committee, we'll bring all those detailed project reports to the standing committee. And 23rd uh, March, when we'll have our project approval board, we will approve funding for all the state technical university to take the agenda of technical enabled learning uh, in the state technical university. Request is bring them to the center stage. Enough of experimentation, piloting, that, that era is over. I mean, I keep telling this to my mission people. If you look at NREGS scheme, it's online. Can somebody imagine? And um, people talk about connectivity, talking about computer literacy not available in blocks, villages. No, Narega uh, NREGS is one scheme where where they have, it has been proved that if that if we have correct intentions, if we believe, they believe that centrally we want to show. Every laborer who is there in India, how many days he has worked, what is his name, we will show it, we will bring it online and show it to, the, to our country, to every taxpayers. They believed in it. In two years, they have done it. You go to any village in this country today, the, the, the M book or, or the must roll of that, uh, of that particular labor is online. If I can do it in NREGS, my engineering colleges, which are I mean, much higher level than all these blocks and villages, Definitely, it's doable. Particularly, second, engineering education is much more doable. I mean, that's the ICT is, 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 is part of us in all engineering colleges. So therefore, my request is, all of you, that once we go back, let's work on a DPR with NITER and prove that, yes, technology-enabled technology learning is going to transform our higher education by making it uh, successful. That would be for me. Mr. Narendran from Microsoft. Uh, thank you, sir. And I just want to uh, make a little bit of a context. A few years ago, my children are both in college now, and they studied in high school both in India and U.S. I asked them, you know, why did you find uh, education good, India, U.S., what teacher? They said, what? We really oh. learned everything we'll, we know from the internet. The schools didn't matter. So, I mean, that's the state of affairs. And I think, you know, it's been said often, we have to move away from a situation where the classroom was the center to where the student is the center of the learning process, right? And, you know, I think as uh, Mr. Praveen Prakash pointed out, our system of affiliating universities actually gives us a way of taking an organized approach to bringing technology-centric uh, learning, bringing new methods of pedagogy and learning uh, in a way that we can completely be ahead of the world. No other country has such an organized system. We can implement this faster, quicker, and it entirely in the hands of the vice chancellors that are here actually to do that. You know, just at a high level, you know, if you think about what contain what you know entails what's involved in learning think about seven different types of things there are books there are lectures laboratories a collaborative work between students tutorials with a teacher or an instructor a quizzes to see your progress and final assessments every one of these aspects can be enhanced covered by our technology personalized in a way that the teacher's burden is reduced to one of actually guiding the student 
uh, to where they have to go rather than standing in front of a you know a lecture hall and lecturing to 50 students 25 of them are not at paying attention at any given time or more you don't really want to be doing that i, I really don't think that we were all uh, looking forward to being you know great speakers if we were doing that we would be in politics as opposed to be in teaching anyway and you know there are there are basically three aspects to making this happen one is of course technology platforms that will allow you to do the seven functions in a way that is productive and allow you to flexibly experiment with them so that you are not burdened with a single model. I mean, it's a time for experiments. Uh, the flipped classroom models have not converged. Uh, there are many ways of doing it. Different teachers may want to do it different ways. So we really need platforms that enable and allow this, ex this kind of experimentation. Second, of course, is lecture content. I mean, we don't have enough. Uh, and that's something that, you know, really we need to work on very hard to do that. And the third, of course, is an execution strategy by all of you for actually getting this out to make it happen. And you as vice chancellors are in the best position to do that, nobody else. I just wanted to just put a little bit of a plug as far as the platform is concerned. You uh, heard about our platform Massively Empowered Classrooms yesterday. You can see the demo. Uh, it has actually been uh, tested out really in the field with universities affiliating colleges. And it's, uh, you know, it's not complete because we are learning as we go along, but it's come a long way. I request you to take a look at it, and we will be more than happy to make it available for your institutions to use it experiment. As far as content is concerned, there is some content, but NPTEL lecture repository is a huge resource of content. Unfortunately, it's not in the right form because they are one hour long lectures, which, you know, which is not really the best way. But we actually have technology. Uh, please talk to uh, Vidya Nadampalli and Siddharth Prakash that will allow you to take NPTEL lectures and use them as the basis to create more MOOCs-like content, inserting quizzes, breaking them into smaller portions automatically and, and with a little bit of you know, addition from the teacher. So uh, again, this is a time for experiments. India can be a leader uh, exactly because of the way we are. And I think as Mr. Prakash said, going back to us, our so-called disadvantages will be our strengths. Thank you. Thank you. Last, I think. Uh no, I think Paul. again, again being the last speaker, I don't think I have much to say except thank all uh, my colleagues. Uh, yeah, how many of us uh, from the academic institutions are from the affiliating universities or colleges? Can you raise your hands? You know, definitely this is less than around 30%, one third. How many from the panel are from the affiliating? Uh, affiliating university, two only. Two. Only two of us. So th they are in minority. Okay. But the Indian higher education system, you know, 87% of our enrollment is in affiliating university system. You know, the college is affiliated to universities. So that is, so this room is not really representative of India's higher education sector in many ways. And uh, uh, I think if we really want to address the quality challenges of India's higher education sector, I think we have to hit the affiliating university system, which for centuries, because this system is how old? It is uh, a 163 year old system. Okay, so we set up the first affiliating universities in 1857, and uh, uh, that became the defining model of India's higher education system. In many ways, it helped us to increase enrollments very rapidly without having to create uh, huge infrastructure. You know, affiliating college system enabled us to reach out to the nooks and corners of the country without uh, too much of dilution of quality. So it, it is not all bad, but as an academic model, it was a little more challenging because uh, this, the teachers in affiliated colleges they had absolutely no say in curriculum formation. Uh, they were basically imparting instruction based on curriculum which was set up by the university. Uh, and uh, uh, they had little role in examination and assessment. So in many colleges, there are internal assessments, et cetera, et cetera. But then you had these academic institutions, so-called colleges, and some of them are very prestigious colleges, where the faculty is not really engaged uh, with the academic processes that are there in any academic institution. So this, in many ways and for uh, decades and centuries, has been considered as one of the limiting constraint 
for quality higher education in the country. Uh, but I think technology is changing the rules of the game. When we want to <coughs> improve quality at a scale that we wish to achieve, I think uh, this organizational model of the affiliating universities and colleges affiliated to them provides us an opportunity. And Anandan pointed it out that this is a unique opportunity for the country. I think what uh, Professor Junjunwala uh, you know, referred to in addressing quality challenges in 100 colleges is a similar you know, concept that you are using a hub where Junjunwala uh, you know, though he is not an institution, but he is actually an institution. He has single-handedly, and uh, when we were doing it, you know, I sent him a mail uh, telling that, do you require any funds for all this? He says, I don't require any funds. I don't know how it is happening. I'm a member of that committee, but he's just making it happen. You know, <laughs> okay. So I think, so that way he is an institution. Here, in this room, you know, uh, this is actually not the first meeting of technical affiliating universities. This is the second meeting. The first meeting we had uh, almost a year ago in Yojna Bhavan in Planning Commission, wherein many of you were present. And it was for the first time uh, that uh, you admitted that technical affiliating universities are being convened, they are being called to play an important role in quality enhancement for higher education. It took me another one year another one year, and Praveen is here, it took me another one year to convince that we have to focus on affiliating, technical affiliating universities. And I can now see the enthusiasm in the ministry and Praveen saying that they are signing MOUs and they are just moving ahead with it. Because I think it provides us an opportunity of using what is already available in the engineering education ecosystem effectively, you know, it's all about using that content effectively, using the ICT infrastructure which is available with us, and any vice chancellor from a technical affiliating university with us? We they have all left. Rajneesh was here. Ah, Aja Assam. But Rajneesh Arora was there yesterday, PTU. He is left. Aja, but, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, sir. PTU also was there. Uh, uh, Aja, so anyway, so, uh, can I tell a secret about the technical affiliating universities? That the secret is that all the technical affiliating universities are extremely rich. <laughs> so, they're sitting over hundreds of crores of rupees, which they have earned through affiliation fees, and they have absolutely no clue how to use it. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so I think it is a huge opportunity for all of us to basically give them a few ideas <laughs> and enable them to use this money effectively to improve the quality of engineering education in the system. And make this is a, in the process. Huh? And make even more money. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think if they do a good job, they will make more money. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, while I'm very enthused that a uh, lot of technical affiliating universities came forward to sign MOUs, but uh, if I can be, uh, you know, a little frank, you know, like you asked Dr. Arora, uh, that how many students are in the, are actually using it. I'm not very impressed with MOUs. You know, we'll be more impressed with how many technical universities have a robust strategy and action plan to embrace technology to improve quality. You know, if they can come out with a robust action plan and implement that action plan, that is, what is needed, you know. I think a MOU is just the first step where they express their intention to do it. And as Praveen has mentioned, the government is keen to support, even financially. I would do not very much like them to be supported financially <laughs> because they have the money. <laughs> you can support them. With, but if required, if there are gaps in resources, those resource gaps can be definitely addressed through public funding from the government. But it is up to the technical affiliating universities to chalk out a strategy or embracing technology uh, you know, at a scale which is only possible through them. You know, between the 25 technical universities in the country, 
they enroll 97% of the engineering student population. IITs are marginal as far as IITs and IITs, they are marginal players in overall volume game for engineering education. So I think the importance of technical affiliating universities in particular and affiliating universities in general to address quality challenges of India's higher education sector are immense. And I think we are making the first steps in that direction. That is going to be the central strategy for quality enhancement of India's higher education sector. As Anand said, that I think this organizational model can be turned on its head to our advantage so that we can really make a huge difference and leverage technology. And you know, I can, uh, I can see Anup is not too happy because you know people from institutions. You know, you passed out from IIT, and you will have no clue of what an affiliating college system is. And therefore, to even understand, it takes a little while. No, you know. Huh? Has been educating. And I think uh, the uh, you know Microsoft research own experiments and uh, led by Vidya on massively empowered classrooms where they basically using these technical affiliating universities uh, to reach out to hundreds of colleges affiliated to them and empower the classrooms. I don't know what that classroom empowerment is. We only heard of empowering the uh, teachers or the students. They are empowering the classroom. So it means they are, they are empowering both the students and teachers, hopefully. Or maybe more than that, maybe the peon and <laughs> everyone. Huh? So, so I think it, there is a huge opportunity of using this model to make it change. Thank you. Sorry. You know, no okay. problem. Uh, uh, I did manage to get about 10, 12 minutes for interactions. And I should thank all my panel uh, uh, member colleagues for making, not you, everybody. I think we'll, we left, each one of us left half a minute for you, so that's fine. Uh, we have, we'll have about 10 to 12 minutes of interaction possible. And uh, I would welcome uh, suggestions, comments, questions uh, from the floor. I think I'll start from here. Somebody can give the mic. Please introduce yourself. I think we'll need a mic here also. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Himlata Chari, but I'm from okay. University of Mumbai, Deputy Director Academic for Distance Learning. And I come from the field of education. And we have been teaching MA education, ICT optional paper for the last two years online in English and Marathi for about 800 students. Now, my uh, main issue was to get teacher coordinators to, because it's one person cannot do manage about 800 students. So what we did was we had our four PCP centers, we divided them into four volunteer uh, coordinators who decided to help me with this of getting ahead with that. Now, first year, we did this on a trial basis, and we got a very good feedback from our MA education students who were placed in schools, who were given in charge of ICT because grade 9 ICT was compulsory. The second year, I could not get these two teachers because they were themselves busy with the credit system. And while I was thinking how I could go about it, I must thank Professor Sanjay Mishra from SEMCA Director, because we were just discussing, and he said, why don't you go about peer tutoring? So I had my senior students who had already undergone this, and they started teaching, and the second batch, and everything is on university website, it is there. But when we ask teachers, my, they always say, is it coming under API score? Can we get this for our CAS promotion? Then we will do. If they have to even design or develop a course material, they say, is that ISBN, ISSN? I mean, there is, it doesn't come how we can motivate them. And the other issue that we have is regional centers. 80% of our students come from Alibagh, Ratnagiri, Raigad districts. So to set up centers there, and that's where I am uh, at the crossroad to know how to go about setting up for them. This is, and for coming from education, I must thank, I had a very refreshing 
session for the last two days. I learned a lot about engineering. And so that's my question. Thank, Thank you. you. I think you had some sub hand raised here. Hello. Maybe next you can come. Uh, okay. Sir, yeah. I'm uh, Director Nitar Bhopal. Uh, I agree uh, what uh, Sri Praveen Prakash ji said that it is the technical uh, state technical universities to play dominant role. Uh, my experience <coughs> is that we are having two shortage of faculty members. Recruitment process is being delayed for more than 10 years. Uh, recruitments are not being done in many states, number one. Number two, uh, we have to concentrate on some of the private engineering college owners also because uh, they, are, they are very uh, crucial in uh, state education, uh, technical education scenario. When uh, there was a uh, program in Raipur, uh, university was not interested, but engineering, private engineering college uh, management were interested. So I think we have uh, to address them also sometimes. Uh, they are very willing to uh, join this move. Number three, uh, we, have, we have to make some policy related uh, to uh, a revision of uh, syllabus because most of the universities are uh, dealing with the syllabus which were prepared in 1990 or 2000. So, and industries are generally complaining that uh, the uh, syllabi are not uh, as per our uh, needs. Uh, regarding the uh, ICT uh, enabled learning, uh, I think the, most of the uh, engineering colleges are interested. Bandwidth connect connectivity may be a problem for the uh, rural uh, colleges, which are located in a rural area. So we have to uh, concentrate on that area also. That is very required. Otherwise, uh, the connectivity, if connectivity is very poor in the rural area, and most of the engineering colleges, in, especially in Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh uh, and Gujarat also, uh, they are not uh, well connected. Uh, as far as the bandwidth is concerned. So th these were the points. Uh, I just want to make one uh, quick comment. Uh, you talked about the syllabi being 1990 and old. I don't know for me, who also worked as the Vice Chancellor of a State Technical University for three years, who prevents us from mo modifying the syllabus. Nobody prevents us from modifying the syllabus. Universities are supreme. And if you don't modify the syllabus, it is our own fault is what my judgment is. Uh, the second point I wanted to just quick point is again, about this curricula, the curricula change, the pressure on universities on the curricula change are from too many directions, are from too many directions. Uh, just to mention a few directions, it is the AICT model syllabi, then we have pressure from industries to change our syllabi. We have pressures from sometimes Reserve Bank of India to include something in our syllabus. We have pressure from the disaster recovery center of country to change syllabus. And we have pressure from uh, the environmental, from the constitution of India, to all sorts of sources putting pressure on the university to change the syllabi, change the syllabi. I think that is one issue that needs to be talked because four years is four years for engineering. And to cover everything in that four years and include all these additionalities that come up from different sources of the society to be included in, this, in, the, uh, in the syllabi is a, is a difficult proposition. Yeah, Professor. Good morning, all of you. Uh, this is Professor Sailu, Registrar of Kakti University, Varangal, Andhra Pradesh. Ours is a traditional university, though we have about 19 constant colleges of our own and uh, about uh, 500 affiliate colleges across three districts of the state. And uh, as far as this seminar is concerned, I'm very happy. I think this is uh, second of the series of meetings convened by MHRD. Uh, as far as using of ICT in higher education is concerned. But uh, for the last two days, we have been discussing about only technical education. And there are many other disciplines, non-technical like pharmacy, management, and other traditional social sciences, arts, and so on and so forth. And uh, again, as far as the preparation of syllabus and e-content is concerned, whatever that is prepared at the IATs, IAMs level, can be used through affiliate colleges like us. Uh, and see, as far as uh, somebody was commenting that uh, they are very rich in terms of funds. As of now, even payment of salaries is a difficult thing every month. Maybe it's 
problem uh, case with the uh, technical universities and again without taking care of the schooling education intermediate education if you can think of using ICT only at the higher education level may not be uh, uh, of course that is useful unless we start using them right from school education level and <coughs> Uh, coming to uh, the psychology of yes, teacher, yes. psychology of students, and psychology of management, including regulators, my personal opinion is that better to introduce a paper like we have a paper called uh, Industrial as a Organizational Behavior, wherein there will be a space for uh, understanding the behavior of management, including regulators, and also teachers and also students. Without that, th that should be a, that should be made mandatory for all the courses, irrespective of the discipline, whether it is engineering, management, or uh, sciences, business, and so on and so forth. With these few observations, I thank you for giving the opportunity. I have a small suggestion to make, very specific suggestion. This is, I'm continuing from where Pawan left. Pawan said that 97% of these technical graduates are through these, through outside IIT and an IT system. Now, what's happening there is one thing which Pawan brought out. I've spoken to VCPTU just now, and I'm speaking on his behalf. There is, you know, it, whatever is being talked, what Ashok talked, what all we are talking about, what ICD can do, or potentially can do, we are still talking of very, very small numbers of, of this IT, ICD intervention. But this revolution has been on for the last 10 years. Last 10 years, while this organized sector was getting organized, Huge numbers, which are far bigger than this 97%, which, which Pavan talked about, has already gotten in the game. Not a single person here is from that group. Okay. That number is humongous. Every corner of the country, every street of Bombay you travel, you will find these boards offering all kinds of studies. Now, there is a huge innovation on. There is a need of the people which is being addressed. Now, here is a specific session which we have, which I have the sanction of Vice Chancellor PTU. And yes, PTU is one of those organizations which is sitting on a pile of cash today. So, <laughs> okay. So, so the specific session is very specific session is that can we expose this group to this vast numbers which are outside the system and can we expose that group to what's happening here? It will do a tremendous amount of group nearly 100,000 people are already organized in that disorganized sector. And we would be very happy, P2 would be very happy to take the lead in this in organizing this uh, and read it. Thanks. Thank you. I think we'll have only Sir. time for two more interventions. Yes. And I think uh, I, I saw this ra uh, hand raised here first. So good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Sidling Soma, Development Officer from Department of Technical Education, Government of Karnataka. Sir, uh, one small uh, suggestion, as uh, Sir mentioned, uh, uh, most of the technical uh, universities are uh, the richest universities in our country. So similar to the CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility in the Industrial Sector, so is it possible uh, for the, I mean, the universities uh, which are rich uh, in terms of uh, financial resources uh, to extend uh, they're uh, part of the <laughs> financial resources uh, to help. Uh, ESR, not CSR. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> CSR. Yes, sir. CSR only. For the, this okay. thing, affiliating okay. colleges. Maybe. Sir, I'm uh, Rohita Shringi from Rajasthan Technical University, Kota. I'm head mechanical, and yesterday only I took over, uh, day before yesterday, I took over charge of director academics. Now, uh, the benefit of this seminar is uh, very immense. Uh, regarding that secret, uh, I must tell that uh, we are into a mode of deficit financing. So finance is definitely an issue. You see, should, learn, uh, see you should learn some lessons from PTU. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, no, sir. We, we have Professor N.S. Vyas from IIT Kanpur who has taken over as uh, vice chancellor of this university. Uh, IIT is deficit which is culture. So, okay. Uh, now, regarding this MOU, I think definitely we can roll out the products which are available free immediately and uh, uh, we definitely will make it an essential component when we affiliate these colleges, we'll make it as a mandatory requirement and that is how uh, we can immediately go in for action plan. Uh, the third February meeting, uh, the third uh, meeting which uh, will uh, 
have the details on the financial models, what kind of investment uh, university has to do in developing the affiliating colleges, uh, definitely we'll take a decision according to that. Yeah. Thank you. I think the last intervention here from uh, Tester University. Uh, we have to see that how these can be delivered more effectively. So the kind of budget that is needed. My name is Vaidya Subramaniam. I am from Shastra University. I'll just make it very short. Now it's the season for uh, you know a common minimum point program. Uh, so in academics as well, in academics as well, we are talking about 25 uh, affiliating state universities. So as we, as I said in the last session in the evening yesterday, uh, we need to identify at least a few priorities that can commonly unify all the 25 state technical universities and uh, see what we can deliver to them through the mission and agree on some common elements that unifies all of them and create an encouraging ecosystem from which we can you know, use that as a springboard and then try to uh, come forward with more interventions as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we had, uh, I'm sure there will be many more who would like to probably pass on suggestions and then all of you are welcome to do that to Mr. Pavan Prakash or to Mr. Pavan Agarwal or to me. And uh, probably we look forward to such suggestions coming forward in the coming few days. I, I'll just uh, probably give one minute each to Mr. Pravin Prakash and to Mr. Pavan Agarwal if they want to, uh, to say something at the end of this session. Uh, I'll just uh, react to what ma'am said. Definitely at, from the, at, at the federal, at the national level, Whatever policy intervention is required to bring technology-enabled learning at the center stage, which requires, we are saying, API training, all definitely will do. We were discussing internally yes, yesterday, and in fact, I was telling this to Pawan sir also. He said, okay, if doing that helps, do it. But finally, it is the, the, the people who are at the ground, the VC has to genuinely believe that technology-enabled learning can, can bring change to his to students. If that belief is there, definitely all, all things will play. Uh, Will put in, will find in place. No, I think the point about uh, the focus on technical education here, uh, it is deliberate, and we wanted some institutions and universities which are non-technical also to be part of this discussion, so that we can carry you. It is your responsibility to carry forward this discussion to the other forums, and we'll be with you. So we want champions. <laughs> you know, who will see the similar thoughts in other fields of study. Thank you. I, I just have three small quick points to add before I close this session. Uh, one for the affiliating university because having run the satellite-based program for all my colleges in the VTU and the, for the first university to start the satellite-based courses for an affiliating university, I think there are three, uh, two difficulties I think which you should take care of. One is the difficulty of timetabling. And I think that is a very real issue, and I think that has to be taken care of. And the second issue is of a regulation change with regard to attendance. This attendance requirements and the regulation requirements, 85% attendance and this technology-based learning programs don't go together. I think you have to take care of these two very simple things, but they are very, what say, uh, difficult to handle, like if very different. Two other, uh, two, two just common points that I would like to say. I, I would prefer, and please don't mistake mine, I say this. Today, IITs also have a 40% shortage of faculty. That's what is in newspapers reports. And IIT should now become, in my judgment, an example of doing these courses through this technology means in their own system, which will introduce a lot of confidence in the other institutions to take up these courses. Today, many institutions ask this question, does the IIT use it? And the answer is no. So I think IIT should become an example of doing these courses within themselves and then ask other persons to do it. They should become examples rather than just what we may call as givers, maybe just givers. Last point is, I think the word has to be collaborative co-invention and not directed learning experiences. See, this directed learning experiences versus the collaborative learning experiences will make all the differences in making this technology route forward in our country. As you said, 97% versus 3%. So 97%, there has to be a collaborativeness rather than a directedness. Thank you very much.
Okay. I should uh, thank all my panelists for cooperating with me. I want to uh, I want to thank Professor Kincha and the panel members for an excellent session. So right now we are breaking for tea, and be back at 11:50 sharp for the next session. Thank you. We come to the last but not the least important session of the conference where we are going to consolidate the detailed discussions that happened in four groups. I am happy to welcome Sri Ashok Thakur, Secretary of Higher Education. You know how busy secretaries are and Mr. Ashok Thakur unfortunately had an additional discomfiture. He was unwell. Uh, he became well most early, only late last night, but today morning he took the hardest flight. Uh, I am personally grateful to him for another reason. For the last several years that I have been working on this national mission project, of course there are additional secretaries and joint secretaries who have been handling individual projects and so on. But he has been personally keeping an eye on the development, giving guidance and correction at every stage, and giving absolutely solid support. I'm sure this is true with all other institutions doing the national mission projects, but at IIT Bombay, I have no hesitation in saying that if we have achieved something, it comes because of the strong support from the ministry guided personally by Sri Ashok Thakur. It's a personal pleasure, sir, to have you here. It is a, it is a long time after which you have been able to make a trip to IIT Bombay. We welcome you. May I request you to chair this session, sir. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to advise the secretary about the names of the four groups. And I'll request him to call a representative of each group. And I request each group to present their conclusions of the discussions in five to seven minutes. Uh, so these were the four groups yeah. which had uh, uh, yeah. discussions on these topics. Yes. So we had. Uh, uh, this was the first topic, future of uh, content creation, was enabling and empowering teachers. The second was, uh, third was uh, content, uh, content delivery, and the fourth was assessment certification. Yeah. These are four yeah. important components. Okay. So you could just name each and call everybody and let them make a presentation for five to seven minutes. Sir. Yeah, the first group on uh, future of content creation. Dr. Andrew JNU. Yes, Dr. Andrew is here. And Dr. Neha Chaudhary, CIS. Okay. Uh, our topic was future content creation. And you can look at them with three different words. Each of them, if you em emphasize, can mean something different. So are we looking at the horizon and trying to predict what are the technological changes that will affect content creation? Are we looking at content creation specific to the NME ICT project, which is what we think we will focus on in this particular proposal. Uh, our group, uh, Mr. Thakur, was made up of about seven educational technologists, yeah. and the rest were educators. I put them as either administrators or as teachers. And as a result, the 14 questions were probably too many for us to discuss, because it was a little chaotic. So I've distilled some of the information out. Uh, let me start by the standard adopted by the NME ICT. There is a common noting that the four quadrant standard that has been adopted, there is unequal development in one, which is video lectures, and insufficient development in the other quadrants. And here's another point which may make me un unpopular in IIT. There is too much of a broadcasting where the content is developed in one source, let's say the IITs, and consumed by the other players in the NMA ICT, which are technical education. Now, one of the suggestions which I think is very important here is that the other aspects of the quadrants, such as the problem-solving environments, the evaluation sections, they can be used. You can utilize teachers of these subjects from other universities and colleges to fill in that content. Uh, the use of simulation and gaming technologies as tools for learning has very little support in this, but there's a very exciting project in IIT Bombay, which should probably receive more focus, where three-dimensional animation uh, an environment tool, I think it's under your development, 
should probably develop more focus into content that can be reusable. Uh, so that, let me go through the individual questions. I'm sorry, the questions are there. The answer to the first one, which is generally on the coverage of NME ICT, the general dec decision was that the cu curriculum is more or less covered. However, it doesn't match with the local curriculum in all cases. Lectures are sometimes too long. The quality standards differ. And there is a lack of reusability. So additional content sometimes needs to be sourced. And this has been brought out by other talks earlier. For instance, gaps in law, management, humanities were not covered. And uh, one aspect when you're teaching technology is to tend to focus too much on the context of the subject. And many of the soft skills required by our students are missing in the educational sector and probably should be added in. The second was to ask whether content creation in Indian languages was keeping with the times. Uh, the solutions were technological, as well as to use crowdsourcing for dubbing, translation, and to develop a few technical standards that could use machine translation as an intermediate to be manually curated and later corrected to create content in local languages. But there are more details in the written document. Uh, the third question was, is content generated by government-funded projects not used to a desired extent? How do we extend this? Uh, the general, uh, and this is much more of a personal point in, is that the government content should be licensed such that it is reusable and the focus should be on accessibility and dissemination. And also content needs to be modularized. There's an example with the NCERT content, which is actually very, very good. But if it is chunked down into modular concepts, it could serve as seeds for developing other content which could be built on even at the undergraduate level. Number four was, are mechanisms that we have to ensure quality standards and content creation adequate? And if not, etc. cetera. Uh, we were a little unsure about the standards used for quality control and quality development. So uh, what we had suggested is that the alternative is not to filter content by setting standards at source, but to allow user preferences as a selection mechanism. Crowdsourcing can be easily used to enforce these standards. And if you have a mechanism to allow transparency, certification, validation, and student feedback, the idea is the best lecture would be selected. Uh, the fifth question was to take care of the changes in technology and how to upgrade existing content. Uh, general consensus was that we should look for integrating different types of content and standards again have to be defined for the individual content such that it is mashable. Uh, the sixth question was specific on the four quadrant me method which I talked about earlier. Uh, is it possible to generate some of the quadrants automatically from other quadrants? We had some discussion on how that is possible. In the context of our in group discussion, it was obvious that you could generate transcripts from video and audio content. Dubbing and language translation can also be generated from these transcripts. And uh, the second point is how do you use the four quadrant to adequately impar self-learning. <clears throat> now, this is the fourth quadrant has to have much more content, and that is the problem-based approach self-evaluation systems. They have to be developed in more. The seventh point was uh, the existing model for creating content is largely project-based, assigned to faculty and academic institutions. Uh, I think I've got the answer wrong, but anyway. The answer that we have in this is that this is critical for the present generations of teachers and requires attention. I'll come back to this point because we discussed it later. The teacher today is considered only a subject matter expert. And with reference to multimedia <coughs> development, we have separate skill sets in instructional design and in multimedia development. And possibly this has to be looked at in which these skills are improved. The next question was, what are the pros and cons of outsourcing some of the development work, such as translation and dubbing, 
And I'll take this in with the other question. There's a large and private, pri large and vibrant private sector. Is there any possibility of leveraging the expertise in this sector? So the answers were more or less, the pros were that yes, you need to get a meritocracy improved, implemented here, and there are obviously improvements in quality, faster turnover, support the creation of an industry specific in this area, and therefore job creation, etc. Sorry. The con was that the educational sector may not be able to afford the industry quality that we have presently. So some sort of an intermediate has to be placed. With reference to using the private sector, that's a linked question. There are government policies regarding checks, balances, and rates, and uh, one has to work out how to use it. The tenth question, a large amount of content is now available from top universities around the world. How can such material be effectively used? Uh, the recommendation is a blended approach. There is a concern that was voiced by many teachers, including by me, and the concern is to prevent a teacher from being reduced to a certifier with a role only in evaluation, because all the content is simply coming in from outside. So it's important to define standards to ensure accountability with teachers both by additional content produced in the other quadrants and by the ability to guide students in all aspects of this content. Point number 11, can we promote the use of open source software? The answer from this group was yes, but it should not mandate the use of open source software. We should have the best of breed tools from being prescribed and used. Uh, the 12th was, should we record classroom lectures of outstanding teachers and make the result content available to the public? The answer should also be that you should reverse the term from outstanding teachers to teachers who can give outstanding lectures. So a suggestion was that rather than only select a few teachers on the basis of some prerequisite, you may also consider that all teachers available can give one or two outstanding lectures and you form a corpus and then use that as a seed. Uh, this is a concern that was voiced repeatedly, and I mentioned it at the beginning, and that we need to give visibility to teachers outside of the privileged institute space, such as the IITs and central universities. Point number 13, should we come up with effective strategies to create textbooks for all universities? Uh, the answer should be yes for core courses, but there is a concern that you will not be able to rapidly change curriculum and therefore the content based on the needs. The half-life of knowledge in our world today is much, much shorter than what it was 25 years ago. And textbooks also have a shorter half-life. Point number 14, how do we use the social media experience and content creation? And how do we ensure that content created through crowdsourcing meets our norms, such as quality? Uh, there are mechanisms for crowdsourcing quality control, but to be honest, by this time, which is the last question, our group had dispersed a little bit and lost much of its interest. So uh, we didn't have much of a question, an answer to this, but I can always get circulated by email and get it back. Now, as a closing comment, there is also a requirement for a clear definition of a platform. This is outside of the questions asked, which allows for hosting mashable content. Content itself should be designed with a granularity that allows it to be mashable to the extent, maximum, sorry, maximum extent, and allows for a definition of adaptive content. Now these are technical terms, and those members of our educational technology community who are part of the group will probably fill in definitions. But uh, translated into English, just the dissemination of video lectures should not constitute the only success story of NME ICT. We need to get much more content and it should be actually generated by the consumer. So they need to have a lot more granularity in modular units which they can piece together into content. There is additional technological challenges. Content has to be meta-tagged and standards defined for knowledge representation. An example is what the Khan Academy does for linking prerequisites for knowledge, so that when you pick up a topic, you know what else you need to read, so that you can reach that particular information. Now, overriding concerns relate to the lack of adequate authoring tools, and this is a strong recommendation that a focused grant effort be made to develop good authoring tools, because the teacher is really handicapped into being simply a subject matter expert here. 
This keeps multimedia development a specialized skill and has a polarized development of content being allotted only to predefined sites through projects funded for this purpose. It is strongly advised that this be democratized to allow all educators to participate in content creation at all levels and, be, and a focus be made to define and ensure authoring tools are available to educators. Thank you. Thank you very much.